Hi, this is Agent Deo Steph, and you're listening to Agent Academy. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash agentacademy. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle or MP3 player. And now, welcome to the Agent Academy. Downloading latest Intel package. Welcome back. I was getting worried about you. Agent Academy, episode number 73, recorded on January 24th, 2020. I'm Agent Goonie Guy. Agent Dewey J. And Agent Vane. And tonight, we've got a lot of stuff to talk about. Well, not too much, but... Uh, enough. We'll be talking about some Go Ruck, about some uh, Wayfarer, as well as the 13 Archetype Spiritualist 7 uh, Challenge, as well as Perpetual Hexathlon. Hexathlon? No other A there. And uh, we have a discussion that we had in our uh, Telegram chat about local rules and things like that. So. Uh, let's go ahead and throw this on over to, I know you've got a lot to talk about, man, so let's go ahead and get, uh, me and Dewey J out of the way. Dewey J, what you been up to? Uh, as usual, doing a little fielding. Had to go shopping, which is an hour and a half away from me. I thought, I'm not wasting that. So, threw about five layers over about half the cell. Uh, I don't think I made any of our players mad that I know of. Uh... And got a little bit of a slight depression going. I forgot that we had an L8 farm 20 miles away from our first Saturday. Forgot to charge it because there's nobody else to charge it, so I'm down to one L8 over there. Dope. Oof. But, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I can travel, you know, 45, 50 miles and find another one. Um, so that's about all for me other than just work, work, and more work. And I, I'm i about the same. I've been working a lot, uh, but I have been doing – just fielding on the way to work and on the way home haven't really been able to get out and do extra stuff so hopefully hopefully this week i'll be able to get out there and really field up the the place but i did i have been playing a little bit of destiny 2 at night uh before i go to bed and last night i was in a thing they call crucible which is like a pvp uh match thing and lo and behold who is on my team but red solo cup and like i just I was having a hard time like playing because there's not really a good communication mode in there that I, that I found. Like there's no typing that I've seen, and so I was like mm-hmm. sending him messages on Telegram. Hey, are you in Destiny Two right now? Um, and anyway, he wasn't. He he doesn't play that. So that way. But it was interesting. I guess it's just a frequently used handle. <laughs> I wouldn't think so, but uh, well, anyway. Like red solo cups. Right? They really like that or song. You could be uh, Solo Red Cup, which is what he had to use on Reddit because Red Solo Cup was just some rando. <laughs> so anytime that people were complaining to Red Solo Cup on Reddit, they were just complaining to somebody that had nothing to do with Ingress. And <laughs> my understanding was that that individual, at, at some point, uh, I think Andrew approached him and said, why don't you just be like the doppelganger? Like, why don't you do the job? <laughs> we get all the complaints, so. Here's some standard answers to give out. <laughs> and uh, that's it for me. How about you, Vane? You've got a lot going on. I mean, I don't so much have a lot going on as I just threw a bunch of lore into the notes here. But for my actual activities, I I had a Go Ruck Light event over the weekend. So that is a six-hour Ruck versus the 12-hour Tough events, which are like their standard run-of-the-mill. But don't let the Light moniker fool you. Uh, we had plenty of logs and other things that we had to carry. And actually, uh, that's what is on my, my hat right now as I lean into the camera for those listening at home without the... Working. You, you know, had me at six hours. Appearance, yeah. So we, we carried a lot of logs, so many logs, uh, and then pretty much I just slept for the rest of the weekend and couldn't move. <laughs> so I'm back to normal now. Um, but yeah, that consumed a lot of my time. And then in between Goruck and trying to will my muscles to continue existing, 
I was just working on a lot of portal resets this week. So uh, Canada, for some reason, was like a hotbed of spoofer activity. Uh, I guess they were all going north for the winter, or uh, like I don't know what was going on there. But uh, just working with a lot of agents on you know both sides of the fence, trying to get portals reset. Uh, that way we can fight back the spoofer menace. So, so in these uh, are these normally like portals that are anchors, hard to get places, or is it just run of the mill? your local bar, tavern, portal? So good question, actually. Um, hopefully, we should have some official information at some point that we can kind of point to that is just like, here's the list of criteria for a portal reset. But I can share with you that with a portal reset, it's typically only reserved for something that is harder to access or would be limited during you know seasonal conditions, whether that is weather or just seasonal closures. Um, you know, think about your hiking portals, anything that is on a military base or is restricted access of some sort that you can't just run out anytime that you want and recapture that portal. So we, yeah. we try to reserve the special access portals or, or things that have a large monetary cost to go and capture for resets. Um, so if I'm approached and an agent says, hey, we want to reset this, uh, you know, this local pub. Sorry, it's not going to happen. Right. And we also, you know, we can't reset portals that have had action taken on them by a legitimate player since the spoofer activity because we can't undo legitimate game actions. So, so. but if it's like a portal that's in like, um, well, this time of year in a closed amusement park, you know, we, we get that portal before the amusement park closes. We know that they're not going to be open in January and all of a sudden it gets flipped? Is that the kind of thing you're talking about? Yeah, pretty much. Like something where it's it's blatantly obvious that that was spoofed, the spoofer got reported, they got banned, and then as soon as we're able to confirm that that has occurred, we submit for reset those strategic portals or you know limited access, seasonals, whatever you want to mm -hmm. call them, uh, for reset at that point. So, so it's not really... So you aren't really minutes. making the... Um, the distinction of whether it's a spoof or not, that has to happen first before y'all can do the reset? Yes, currently. Uh, we, we've got to pretty much go through the hoops and all the red tape and say like, hey, this account was reported. It was suspected of wrongdoing. Is this actually the case? Was action taken against it? And then if that holds up, then we can proceed with the reset. So awesome. it's kind of a lot of back and forth and information gathering and making sure that things are legitimate for proceeding with the reset that way we're not undoing actions that someone has legitimately taken right. so what is the first i guess first step if it's like i think this has been spoofed so if you have a difficult to reach portal that you believe has been spoofed going to the trusted reporters is definitely the the first step in the line of defense so i know uh, a few episodes back we had mentioned that the trusted reporter program had been restarted um we can toss both of the Telegram bot IDs, the account IDs, into chat somewhere or on the show notes. But uh, there's an account for the Enlightened and an account for the Resistance where if you have a portal that you want to submit saying that this was spoofed down and it's hard to reach, there's a process that you go through there as kind of the first step. So it sounds like we need to make a complaint department on the podcast website and list those two links. But explain that you know this isn't just because... I got pissed off because they they took out you know the six layers I just threw. Right. It's, it's it's a process that they have to go through. Do they also have to then take the extra step to say uh, do a reset, or is that something that you guys just they would just consider and do? So there is a question for it. Um, when you fill out the form through the Trusted Reporter bot, it does ask, do you want to request a reset of this portal? Um, so I have seen a couple before where agents they weren't really concerned with resets. Uh, they just wanted to see that action was taken against the spoofer, but it, that's a case-by-case -case basis. Sweet. Thanks. That's great info. All of the info. But I don't think you were done. No. <laughs> there, there's the wide array of ingress lore happening within the, the last week. So I, I don't know how many of you out there um, you know, subscribe to all the lore tidbits, and I'll try not to go too over the top of heads here and, and keep it more on the, the straight and narrow, but I think everybody is aware that our current um, enemy, both of the Enlightened and the Resistance, 
is Nemesis. So a character that was working with Nemesis at one point by the name of Stuart Leitner had started leaking a few of the Tessellation Tesserae pieces as physical dead drops. So a few of you may have been following those. Uh, Philadelphia had one, LA had one, San Diego, uh, I think Vegas as well at some point, and then a few others in other places in the world. Um, but this kind of all ties into the Tessellation in, in some extent. And Stuart Leitner, that uh, specific character, was actually out at the Sundance Film Festival yesterday in uh, Park City, Utah. And he gave a, a quick interview, just kind of going down a few questions that Essex had. Specifically, he was asked if there was any information that he could share about Copper Plate, which is a suspected, you know, well, not suspected, we've confirmed at this point as one of the nemesis uh, villains or uh, whatever you want to call them in the nemesis magnus. Um, and that Nemesis is pretty much always listening, so we don't know too much about Copper Plate yet, but they could be coming soon, maybe, potentially. Um, and then a few other good tidbits that were offered there was that uh, Nemesis loves to feed us misinformation. So we believe that we know what the tessellation is actually for, and that could be potentially preventing exogenous entities, so your shapers, your nazir, from influencing our dimensional node, which is called the Osiris node. Or for those of you that were from the 1218, 2012 through 2018 ingress, 1218 node. Um, and pretty much we don't know what is happening with the tessellation, but Nemesis is kind of placing pieces on the tessellation board, and that might not be where the pieces actually have to go. So that was the little hint that Stuart Leitner had given uh, everybody during his interview. So, Lord, as I'm sitting through here monologuing about that, I'm like, this is going completely way over the heads. Way over the heads. No! Keep going! <laughs> Let me Sorry, see I, was, I was actually um, trying to work on putting you on your own camera, and so that's why I wasn't like I saw it. Did we lose Goonie? I was like, oh no, is he gone? It's just me now. Um, <laughs> nope, it's just you. I do have one thing to report. Jamie J. Blaze did get the code already. He makes sure it was uh, 9 8, 8 19. I'm sorry, 9 18 Eastern Time. So, you know, we always have to keep track of him. I'm Get trying to do it early. I'm just trying to give you a little time, Goonie. Did it, did it work? Oh, no, I'm good. I was. Oh, okay. He's ready. Yeah. He's on top of it. Keep going. So, so what's next on, on the lore chat? So, one of the big things that is kind of unknown at this point in time is a artifact, a prime artifact called the Undyne Silica, which is potentially tied into a third exogenous race. So, we have the Shapers, we have the Nazir, Shapers for the Enlightened, Nazir for the Resistance. And we have a potential third faction, which was teased and introduced a little bit at the uh, previous Mission Day at Sea event, where 1218 Hank Johnson, uh, or at least we believe potentially that it was the 1218 Hank Johnson. So, you know, buff Hank, not the, not the scrawny Hank, um, was potentially looking for this prime artifact called the Undyne Silica, which may or may not be able to influence the tessellation. Um, and was kind of teasing a little bit at this third exogenous faction. So we may get more eventually soon trademark kind of territory on that, but something to keep in mind. More lore is always good. I, I um, hope they do some more videos like they did for the last, you know, round, I guess I'll say. Uh, th that was interesting just seeing nice quality videos and and yeah. some story evolve in that way where you can just kind of watch it like a video and hopefully they'll do another anime season yeah i personally really enjoyed the the dun raven videos and i i was able to at navarro 2018 
actually talk with one of the producers for the media. I know I'm kind of breaking fourth wall a little bit here, but just being able to go to them and, and say like, this stuff is great. Like, please continue doing this. Um, and of course we got the Dunraven series. That was really fun. And that kind of culminated in the Colon uh, event. Um, got so close, so close, made it to the, the finalist round for Colon, but just didn't quite get there. But, um, Everybody that went out to that looked like they had a blast, and I really hope that they just continue doing events like that because it looked like a really good time. The thing I liked about those videos is that they kind of had their self-contained plot. So if you were following those videos, you really didn't have to know a whole lot about lore or anything. So you could just follow just that plot and kind of keep track. Now, if you knew the lore, there was a lot of stuff there that, that it added in. But, yeah, if it's an introductory, it's like, what is this? And then you could just follow them. And it was it was really good to see that uh, like they dropped media a month ago or a few weeks ago that had had the video where the where he was explaining you know kind of the lore up to date and so that was that was a good yeah. catch up. I agree. Yeah, we had the uh, the pack video that explained what the the rules of the tessellation were in kind of like a nutshell version versus the the long-winded post on the forums, which I think was a benefit to a lot of agents. Yeah. And so more, more media. We love media. We just need a media capsule. <laughs> and Here we go. And apparently, five days ago, they released a, a bunch of videos, like five videos. And I don't know if it was for the challenge, but um, we'll talk about that challenge in just a second. And I think that's it. Everybody's week? Yep. Last call. Okay. So let's move on to some news and discussions. And I think the first thing here is the uh, Wayfair made some changes. Yeah. It looks like that they put in um, another way to report abuse. I know that a lot of it, I've, at least in our area, uh, in the chats, people are talking about, you know, some of these uh, Wayfair or OPR uh, submissions are just ridiculous, you know somebody puts in their foot or, you know, something that's stupid. And it's like that person, th that agent, whoever put this in needs to be accountable for that. Um, so maybe this is a response to some of that. So um, they have a form that you can get to and you can find it. I thought I'd make life a little bit easier. So it came up with a little bit link link. So bit.ly slash OPR abuse, O-P-R-A, all capital. And we'll post that out so you guys can get to that. And what it is, is it's just a Google form uh, for active wayfinders. Uh, so you have to be a wayfinder and you have to have your email, of course, when you submit it. And what it does is in addition to giving that low rating in OPR or Wayfair, uh, you can tell them that, hey, this is a offensive or abusive in the title, uh, invalid location. Uh, it has a photo issue. Uh, it's a fake nomination and those kind of things. Um, and I'm assuming then that they'll be able to take more action on that particular submission. I don't know if that means that they're going to kind of go back to the person that submitted it and kind of give them a strike, so to say. Um, but it does give you a way to do more than just simply say, yeah, this don't make this a, a portal. Yeah, and that was kind of, sorry to cut you off there. Do it. That was kind of fed in by... There, there had been a few specific cases, and I was involved in one of those cases just from, like, the outside looking in where there was rampant abuse of OPR from specific individuals that were kind of just flooding the system with low-quality submissions. And even if they were getting flagged, it was still just a high volume of low-quality subs coming in. And that's why the, the form is there, to, to report those kind of special circumstances where you're noticing a pattern and it's just continuing to happen and it's just not helping anyone. So, and would it be things, would it be that if uh, somebody has a history of that, you know, a history of abuse over and over and over again, it's going to make it so they can't submit. Uh, I'm trying to think if the, the little blurb that they shared about that mentioned something about like, if you know, this could restrict an individual's access to OPR if they are found to, you know, 
be abusing the system. I, I think it does say something along along those lines there. Well, uh, and didn't there used to be a, a thing where if your rating dropped too low that you'd have to like take the quiz again or something? Yeah, and it, as far as I'm aware, that still happens if, if your rating falls below the threshold for too long, but I, I don't OPR enough, unfortunately. I need to do, I need to do more OPR. Well, we, I, here I've, I've got on the... Uh, on, on an Ionic page of what action will be taken on the report. And they say once they receive the report, uh, they'll review reported nominations and edits and other nominations and edits submitted by the submitter. Uh, players submitting invalid nomination edits may receive a warning or a suspension or have their Wayfarer account terminated in case of repeated offenses where a submitter is not active in Wayfarer, their ingress or Pokemon Go account may also be affected. So, um, and in case there were waste spots or inactive and should, should not have been approved, may also investigate the Wayfinder's involvement and approval issue penalties on severe severity of the offense. And it looks like they might get some warnings or punishments for, for that. So, and this is, of course, uh, I guess you would say cross game because it's going to be something that would affect not only ingressors, but those uh, pogo players as well. This is kind of funny. So I put up the Wayfair screen on the live stream and it, you know, it shows submissions it, around your area. Uh -huh. And this picture that I have up right now is actually one that I submitted. And now I wonder if I can actually go to, oh, uh, where would it be? Would it be under nominations? Did it get turned down? It got turned down. But <laughs> let's see what my picture is compared to that one. But it's sitting up uh, there as a featured way spot. So let's see. Here's I got a bunch that's in voting right now. Uh, I mean, I would imagine that nomination would show up as a duplicate. So I, I would hope it doesn't say rejected. I hope it says duplicate. There it is. Man sitting on a bench. I mean, there's no one in it. It's if there's nothing around it, is there? What do you mean? Is there another portal like within five feet no 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 it's actually uh pretty far away this other one that i have this one actually got approved like you can see that it's accepted uh -huh. but library. it actually got denied because it was too close to another portal so it still yeah. shows as accepted in wayfair which i think is weird i think that's something they could change to maybe put the reasoning if it's uh accepted but not put into not valid, so to say. The portal network. It'd be nice, and I think I've said this before. If it was a system similar to what the what they have in uh, geocaching, that you know, when you submit, when you first submit, it looks at that area and it'll tell you, no, you can't submit it because it's too close. It just stops it at that point. Right, and like this one's marked as a duplicate, but it's not a duplicate. There's actually two signs that are the same sign that are, uh, they're fairly close, but I would say at least. Uh, 100 yards away from each other um and so i think that's why someone saw it and and yeah you know you see the other one you go oh that's a duplicate and now i could resubmit and put hey there's actually two signs you know scroll out and look on the map a little better and you'll see this one's over here um, and that's that's a hard call to make especially if you're judging a portal based on just what you're seeing in google maps and and google street view I mean, there's times that I've seen things. I'm like, well, this could be all new construction, and I'm looking at Google Maps, and you know, and that the Google Maps data and the street stuff is like three years old. So yeah, there, this could have been new construction, but I have no way of knowing that. And you know, it could be Albuquerque, New Mexico, you know, that fall into my lap. So I got no way of knowing. And what are you gonna do? What so are you gonna do? You you, you rate it as a two, and you go on. <laughs> right so that's that's a good change and there's also where is it 13 archetypes what what do we have what's this week's uh spiritualist and so, so omniscient was the first is that what it looks like yeah looks like this one hit hit the stores so oh, to say on the 20th so I, it wasn't on a Monday. Uh, yeah, so I guess it was a Monday. Actually, I guess it was Co Curu. Yeah. And it was written by Key Click and tested by Ra Ra Random Isaac Isaacs. 
So last I looked at it, there was just about 700 solvers for it. So, uh, and so we're going to read out all the names. Okay. Go. <laughs> you start with the first one. We'll just uh, round robin this, get through it real quick. Okay. I'll do it in two words. You ready? Resistance enlightened. There, we're done. <laughs> Good job, everybody. Oh, great. So have y'all been, uh, doing any of the challenges? Not really. I, uh, I got a feeling that this last one was simple, or what, not simple, but it's pretty much straight decoding. Is that right? I haven't even looked at it. Yeah, the, the first way it killed me, honestly. Like, it it's so frustrating to put so much work into something and then just be like, oh, I don't get involved because of a bug. Yay. So now even if I complete the rest, I can't grapes. have them all. Um, and then I got busy at work, so it was a good excuse yeah. not to do it. <laughs> well, and I don't, and I don't have the tools, so to say. I'm, I got a feeling that you know, people that said, "Oh, this is a decoding one. Oh, I put it in this, put it in this, put it in this, and see if it comes out." And evidently, on this particular one, they put it into the usual suspects. This, 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 and it didn't come out right. So they're like, "Oh, we're actually going to have to work on this one." <laughs> and there's there's a, a a really good site that has a ton of different like decoding tools for all these different uh, languages and eventually it's probably too late now i i started on it uh with the first challenge because i was going to post the infographic with how to do it after it was released the the solve um but then i got bitter so but we <laughs> need a page where we can post all these tools uh for yeah. decoding challengers and there's there's been uh sites in the past to help out with decoding challenges some of them are defunct some of them aren't updated so if we had a page at least that could point to those as well as, as some of the tools that you can use now in tele Telegram chats and things, I think that would be good. Yeah, personally, I haven't had the time to sit down, and I know that I would need to learn a lot about the decoding. So I just I haven't had the earnest time to sit down and actually learn the proper way to do it. So yeah. eventually, if they, if they stay live for a little while, I, I might be able to get around to learning some of them and, and going through and actually challenging myself. Um, if we could just stop all the spoofers, <laughs> then I'll get that time back and then I can learn to decode. But, you know, I just I was just thinking, actually, it's a good time to do this kind of stuff because people complain about, well, it's so cold outside. I can't go out and do this. I can't do it. This is something you can, quote, unquote, do on your couch. You know, people yeah, talk about trying to be able to do more that's off scanner. And it's never cold for ingress. Never. And in groups with friends. I mean, you, you can make friends who are all interested in doing this. Like, I think this would be a very interesting episode if we could find someone who is really good at doing the the Pasco challenges in general in, in, and come on and actually just have a... And it may not be a weekly show thing, but like a special episode and yeah. go through the process of what is normally done to figure out the, the codes and I think if people saw that process, instead of having to like try to look through forums and and sites and and try to figure out like ah where do I just start, uh, just kind of seeing that process, I think that would help so many people um, get interested in it and start doing it weekly or or how often uh, yeah. they're released. Okay, Telegram chat people, find us a coder that can talk. We'll bring them on. I think that's our two requirements. Can talk, can decode. We'll decode for money, or we'll decode for food. <laughs> Something like that. Like okay. It. So uh, congrats to the people who figured it out. And if you want to get involved, you can uh, look at the show notes and get the link to the uh, community post for it. But you can also just go to the community.ingress.com and look into the kind of challenges, uh, special events areas. Look for the... Um, spiritualist or archetypes challenge and you'll find it. Yep. Also, we have an update. Let me get this up there on Perpetua Athlon Metal Distribution update. And I believe we all decided to leave this one to Agent Vane to <laughs> discuss. <laughs> you tried to explain it to us, and then we're like, what? What? Eventually, I think we got it, but it's his job now. Okay, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna bring up my scanner because I think this will be an easier way to, to, to talk through it. So the key change that you have to understand is that if you participated in a field test prior, so 
if you already earned the elite hexathlon, and, and for those of you listening at home that don't have the visual aid, I'm showing the field test hexathlon elite medal in my scanner alongside the regular, uh, just regular field test hexathlon medal. So originally when they announced Perpetua series for field tests, or sorry, hexathlons, the way that the medal was going to work is that you would get the Perpetua medal, and if you placed in the top 10% at any of the sites in at least one of the six categories, you would also get the Elite Hexathlon medal, which was going to be repurposed from the field tests. So it's going to be the same artwork. It was just going to be a renamed badge in your scanner. So technically speaking, if you had already earned the Elite medal from the field tests, you would have that medal. It would just be renamed to, say, Elite Hexathlon. What has changed in the recent update is that rather than reuse the existing medal, that medal is going to stay unchanged in your scanner if you already earned it in September. And then going forward for the Perpetua series and possibly the series beyond that, you'll be able to earn a participation medal. So that's the first tier, which is what the gold medal is that we have available through the social media for Perpetua. And then if you place in the top 10% for any of the six categories, you can then tier up that participation medal to the elite version. So just like any other challenge medal, when you open it in the scanner, you'll see, oh, I you know, got the initial participation badge, but then I also leveled it up to the elite status. Now, is that you top 10 in the, the area or the place that you are at the hexathlon? Or yes, the, the specific site that you're registered site. to. So yeah. if I go to... I don't know, Juarez, I have to beat everybody to get in. Oh, I have to be in the top 10% of all the people at Juarez. For one of the six challenges. So you can actually get elite status in multiple uh, challenge criteria. So out of the six things that are going on that day, you just need to get top 10% in one of them. So, so it's not really top 10% of people at that site. It's the top 10 for the six different things. In at least one of the criteria. So... Uh, I've got a picture of my, my stats from September, but I got the elite hexathlon medal by getting, I think, elite status in three out of the six categories. I think I had like artifacts collected, glyph hacks, and one other thing, I think like resonators deployed as my top 10%. And I think total we had about 220 people registered for the Rhode Island field test in September. Only about 170 of them showed up. So there was actually a lot of dead space on the bottom of the leaderboard for people that were just all zeros in terms of stats. So don't know if they're going to filter those out somehow yeah. uh, going forward. But it, it's if you're dedicated to trying to get elite, the best strategy that I can offer you is after you get the minimum six uh, categories knocked off and you have earned the participation medal, Focus on one thing that you believe you can do extraordinarily well. And every five minutes, if it works the same way, you'll be able to go into the app through the uh, ticketing system. So you'll be able to go main menu, events. Then you can pull up the ticket for that site. And you can actually, in your web browser, refresh every five minutes to see what your stats are live. So you'll be able to see the scoreboard, where your placement is, whether you have elite status in any of the categories, or if you're falling above or below the average. And that makes a lot more sense because, you know, when I first looked at it, I was thinking it was just top 10% at the site. And that's like, you know, that's going to really cut that, make that badge hard to get. But now if you're looking at top of those six different areas, theoretically, you could be looking at 50% of the people, maybe, somewhere in that area, uh, getting that elite status if everybody goes their own way. It was a little bit of a push. Um, definitely one thing that I noticed from the September site that I went to was that most of your people that had elite in one category had it in several other categories. Mm -hmm. So, like, I ended up, um, I don't know, an hour and 15 minutes into the 90 minutes uh, deadline to get all the achievements done. I think I had elite status in five categories. But then I started focusing on just ensuring that I couldn't get knocked out of place in anything. So I just went really hardcore on getting artifacts collected. Um, 
and then I kind of lost elite status in a few other categories, but stayed very close. Um, so I think it was still like top 15, top 20% in a few other things. See, and you were, you were smart. I was stupid. I thought, <laughs> like, when I saw Elite come up next to one, I was like, okay, good, I got it. And then thought it was done. Like, I had Elite then, you know. Uh, you did so. have Elite. You didn't keep it, but you had it. Right, right. So it's not a uh, first one to get it. It's it's overall uh, scored. So you might the buzzer uh, that can't take the one that you're thinking that you want to try to get a lead for and save that for your last thing. I mean, if you can do a little bit along the way, whatever, but then at the end, just keep there and just until the end of the event, just keep going with that one to the very end. Now, yeah. did this kind of make people want to be more individualistic or did it kind of dissuade people from team play? Uh, uh, from what I saw, um, there was a lot of team play, and it may have been people n not caring or not knowing uh, the rules completely, but um, there was one agent that was actually riding with me for uh, most of the time uh, because she had an um, injury, and we both didn't have our uh, trekker one at that, and we both got out, and these two guys actually um, said, oh, we'll do it and uh, like grabbed her and picked her up and just started running around with her <laughs> to, to help her get the that's team play, that's team play there right like yeah. it, it was extraordinary and it was like awesome and you know we still didn't make it because of that bug and then luckily they gave the badge later so that that was good um but yeah so there was teamwork there i don't know otherwise i don't know what did you see vane so I kind of went into it um, trying to gather as much information as I could about what the event style was going to be from the sites that went ahead of the U.S. So I kind of cheated a little bit and did my homework and, and figured out like, okay, here's what they were doing over in Asia. Here's what they were doing in Europe. Um, so I knew what the, well, we all knew what the categories were going to be. We had media artifacts, mods deployed, glyph points, portal hacks, resos deployed, and uh, the kilometers walked. But I kind of knew that it was going to be an individual type play style. Um, I carpooled with a bunch of agents up, and then we kind of all decided that this was going to be an event where we would treat it sort of like an anomaly in the fact that you're going to be on foot where possible. We had a couple of people cargressing the event, um, but it definitely leaned more towards if you're able to get out on foot and participate that way, it was a little bit of a benefit. So I did see both factions where... There were groups of friends that were kind of going through the event as a, a team, quote unquote, making sure that they could check off all the boxes. And then we did have a wide array of people that were just going there as individuals. Yeah. So my strategy throughout the, the Rhode Island hexathlon was pretty much going through and uh, they had a map that you could view. So as soon as you hacked the media instruction that kind of told you like, here's your task list, what you have to do from the registration portal. Uh, it had a map that was tied into it that showed you where all the artifact portals were. And hilariously enough, in Rhode Island, I guess whoever at Niantic was making the maps must have been bored or they're just trying to hide any Easter eggs. But the media artifact portals in Rhode Island were laid out in a heart pattern. So <laughs> the play box that we had, it was kind of like, oh, here's a media portal, here's a, you know artifacts. Sorry, media artifacts, same thing in my mind. Um, so those were laid out in a big ring. So my strategy was just, Keep I'm going to play like how I, I normally play. So doing pretty much all six of the criteria, but I'm going to just loop the artifact portals as much as I can. So every time I came up to an artifact portal, I glyph hacked it. If it had open mod slots, I was tossing a heat sink on it, glyph hacking again, tossing a heat sink, glyph hacking again. And if the resistance were continuously blowing it up, <laughs> I was just a point where he thinks, I'm like, I'm getting more artifacts, I don't care. Yeah. So, I mean, it worked because I got fourth place in artifacts, so yeah. I'll take it. Yeah, and I can see this being better for those people that are not quote-unquote team players. You know, if you if you go no to an enough and you want to be, oh. yeah, <laughs> I just want to play. I don't want to have to deal with people. An anomaly is probably not much fun, but in this case, you you could enjoy yourself. And you never really have to talk to anybody. Yeah, I think during the, the first one, I, I kind of felt like 
I, I think there's a lot of other stuff going on too, but it really felt like, oh man, they're like trying to kind of get r- rid of the faction love. Like they want more cross faction and now it's like single play. But I, I've kind of started feeling kind of like what you're saying, dude, Jay, like it's just another way to play ingress. And so I think it is good to have another offering. Yeah, and I've noticed in the stuff that we're seeing for the people that are quote unquote advertising their upcoming uh, hexathlons, they're saying, "Hey, we've got other events. We're doing this. We're doing this. We're doing this." Yeah, I think they they recognize that it could be kind of a lone wolf type event, but we're going to put us stuff out there so that you can get that faction love, so that you can you know meet and greet those people and and uh, have something to do as a team. Yeah, only so. Yeah. I, and I, I hate to, sorry, I'm, I'm interrupting. No, go for I'm it. Jumping in, but I hate to put it in this perspective, but from somebody that is in the point of view where most anomalies, I'm either a captain, I'm a captain plus doing some sort of organizational role for the faction. Um, I have a lot of responsibility in anomalies typically. The, the field tests are like first Saturday type events are kind of like the event that I can go to and I'm like, I have no stress. I can just <laughs> go and play the game and, and completely have fun. Not to say that I don't have fun in Anomalies, but it's kind of like Anomaly is more structured and more, okay, here's what we're going to do by the books. And I can take the Anomaly play style that I love and I can toss it into a Hexathlon event and just have a lot of fun with it without having like the pressure of winning or losing or you know any of that so personally that's why i like it but i i just want to toss out there that i do believe that ingress the people at niantic do hear the concern about this kind of sense that things are moving away from faction versus faction play and going more for like player versus environment i i don't think that that is the message that they're trying to send right now even though it does come across that way with some of the events we've had so like we should get more faction versus faction. We're, we're definitely, from the Vanguard point of view, saying this is what the players want. So they are hearing that. Well, you boys, it, come on up here. We'll give you some faction. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, at this point, area. at this point, I'm ready for Team Rocket to invade because it's just like all green here, and it's it, it gets boring, you know? And, yeah. and so I would love for new resistance players to to come play but it's like um a gr- um, a lady i work with is is re- turned out to be resistance but she doesn't really play she was doing it for pokemon go endeavors but her friends were resistance too and there's there was three of them and when she told them that she worked with me they were like effing goony guy like <laughs> they I thought i was like falling around and, like just do what <laughs> I was going to suggest, now I can't do it. I was going to suggest that, Goonie, that we meet in Tupelo, Mississippi for our first Saturday coming up because that's, that's kind of kind of close to you. But unfortunately, I, I got roped into a couple other things on that Saturday. So I'm going to have to pull a rain check on that one. I would love to have done that one. But Well, are, are you planning to go to any um, hexathlons? Uh, unless there is a f- feed the resistance... Uh, starter that you know does that for me i'm I'm planning but there's no way i i'd like to i think but where would be the nearest one for us it's well i'm in between miami and dc so i'm looking at dc potentially dc's 12 hours away and it's close yeah and i think it's it's like nine something plus for me but i do have in-laws that live in that area and there's an agent we know that lives near there. there is, that is true. Somebody who probably has a couch. Is it bad that I'm I'm going to both Miami and DC, and Miami's like a 18 hour drive somewhere around there? Are you driving road, it? We're we're gonna split it up. We're gonna get a road trip together with at least like four agents, and just kind of pick up people along the way. Um, so I'm hoping I might be able to like kind of break the trip up by just crashing at somebody's place and then we're like okay let's get up in the morning and continue yeah. driving but hotels are cheap when you're on the road and you and don't care people. too much yeah and it, it, well if you want to come through Huntsville you, you got a place to yeah. stay but I think that would add another 18 <laughs> hours way, to right? the trip. Yeah, it's totally on the way <laughs> yeah I don't I don't think I'm on the way 
Well, no, that's what I was thinking. If we, if I was driving to D.C., I could take a little longer trip and go straight up and meet you at wherever you would be going pretty much straight across, I think. Yeah, about, the, about the mountains, the base of the mountains, we could meet there. And then, like, you know, head that way and then meet up with uh, Agent Vane and do, like, a live Ooh. podcast what? while we're doing the thing. What is that one? Or something. What's the uh, date on that? The name? No, the date. Oh, on the water. April, late April, or is that for DC? Yeah, yeah, yeah. April twenty fifth, I believe. Uh, let me check Ooh. calendar. It's this is it's probably fun. right here. Yeah, Lexicon Hex Athlon is yeah. April twenty fifth. I'm liking. Okay. Your, I, I I hate to say this, but I'm liking your idea. I, I get a few every once in a while that are not horrible. Even a blind squirrel gets a nut, <laughs> or a blind frog gets a, a blind frog gets a fly. fly. Yeah, even a blind frog will hit a fly every now and then. I don't know why. I swallowed a fly. I like flies. Uh, okay, well, we had a topic to talk about too, but we have like <laughs> five minutes left in the show. I think. Yeah, we could save that. So I feel like we should save it, uh, and I would really like to get some audience participation in it because we had it in the chat a little bit and then when we said hey send in a message like the chat stopped like no one wanted the info in, in the show I guess I don't know but we would love Maybe to get audio with some negative stuff it's like send this stuff in or we're going to turn off the chat Right? no I think it's a great discussion and the discussion we're talking about is basically um guidelines local rules i think even like maybe safety guidelines is um potentially kind of in that topic too but um you know every area kind of has their their um house rules basically yeah it's a good way to put it house rules i like that and i i don't you know some people think like uh, no one needs those anywhere and they may be <laughs> right <laughs> and I would love to hear the opinions on both sides. Like, what house rules do you have in your community? Uh, what house rules do you do you try to find those out if you go to someone else's community? Because by and large, there's the global com community, no matter where you are. Do we need rules? And and rules is really kind of, I think guidelines is more. Guidelines probably a better word. Um, by the way, we do things. Yeah. And yeah. uh, so let us know what your opinion is on that. You can actually l leave us audio. You can just send us a message in Telegram and audio if you want with video, either one, or you can leave it on our answering machine, which is just speakpipe.com slash agent academy. And it's just an, a voicemail where you leave a message and then we have an MP3 file we can play live on the show. And we would love to hear your comments on that or anything else there mm -hmm. or in Telegram. And uh, we'll have this discussion on um, the next episode. So it, we may just, unless there's like tons of news, we may just forego news and do the discussion first and then do new news oh, after oh. that. Ooh. I'd love to have this, this house rules discussion. So I would encourage agents that, you know, some people might, might not be comfortable sharing their, their opinion if they're the type where they're like me, where... I don't believe in house rules. Right. So, please, you know, bring forth those magical comments and uh, hopefully I will remember all of the horrible things that I've done in the past uh, <laughs> areas to talk about on the next show. <laughs> well, no, and I think that's good to know, like, um, why? Why you don't think there should be house rules? Because I, I kind of agree with you there. Um, <laughs> and, you know... Um, yeah, I'm going to say you, you, if you have that local house rule or that thing, there's usually a reason why. And, and sometimes it could be something stupid like it's because the most powerful agent in the area wants it that way. Or it's I've got to drive 50 miles to find an L.A. portal. So some of them make sense. Some of them may not. Yeah. And it all depends on the community and the agents Definitely. involved and that's the whole discussion there's a lot more there and we could oh, turn this yeah. into a three-hour podcast tonight along that topic also send us your your juicy little bits where if you don't believe in the house rules what what standard of gameplay do you hold yourself to because i know me personally 
because I don't follow or prescribe to quote unquote house rules, I still have a standard of play in how I approach different situations. So when I see, you know, that loan level eight portal, and we can get into those details next time, but that's the kind of juicy stuff we want to hear about. Yeah, Vane's honor code. I like this. Put in, put in your little uh, story if you had one where you unknowingly or knowingly broke one of those rules and what happened. Yeah. And speaking of breaking rules, I'm going to break the rule of forgetting to give the passcode like I've <laughs> done the last couple episodes, and I'm going to give it right now, and it is AA. We remembered AA. <laughs> so go to the site and put that in. You can put if you know the page, you can go now. It's already up. JBJ Blaze has already earned it. And his I was looking earlier, I believe he's been subscribed to the channel with not just subscribe, but the prime subscription thingy, I believe, for twenty nine months straight. Something crazy like that. Uh, we also had uh, Firesight subscribe uh, for 10th month tonight. Uh, we had some follows this week. Diluted Potato One, Disco Bobcat, uh, Board of Prey, and Jelly Jelly Lily, uh, and uh, Cheeto OSX, uh, and a few others. So uh, hit that subscribe, hit the join. If you have amazon prime you can actually join the subscription tier one for free and you get some icons you can do in chat and stuff like that so we always appreciate all that and unless anybody else has anything else to say i'm going to end this show anyone <gasps> i've got plenty to say but you won't let me say it so i'll, I'll just, just say house rules i'm gonna like just start taking i'm gonna I'm going to have to write everything down. So, like... <laughs> well, we have a can start now. <laughs> it, that's All it. Right. I heard Dewey that's J saying something. No, nope, I'm saying... Talk to you. Not saying anything. Good night, everyone. Night, everybody. Peace.